We've all had questions. Let me put it this way. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, there were questions that arose in your mind. If, if you didn't have these questions, I would really be surprised. And that is, knowing that eternal life now is set before you, that you are saved, that you have a place with God in heaven, what does that look like? What will I look like? What will heaven look like? Will we have relationships uh, with one another? I know I've had those thoughts, and I would guess that many of you have. Nearly every culture that has ever existed has had some understanding of life after death. The American public was polled, and 80% of Americans said that they believed in some form of life after death. And certainly, as we see in the passage today, there were first century Jews that believed in life after death. Their Talmud that contained the written and oral traditions all pointed to life after death. It was filled with references to life after death. And today we are confronted with that question about heaven. Now the Pharisees and the Herodians had already posed questions to Jesus. They had tried to trap him uh, during this Holy Week period. As I mentioned last week, we are in this passage. We've gone back to chapter 12 of Mark's Gospel, and we will be covering 12 and 13 to finish up the sermon series. And if you, uh, if you look at chapter 13, uh, it will say that uh, it is two days before uh, the Passover. And so we believe that it's probably Tuesday of Holy Week that Jesus is in the temple, that he is teaching, and uh, these different sects come before him. The Pharisees and Herodians have already Post questions and he has set them straight and today we have another Jewish sect and that is the Sadducees. So if you have your scriptures and would like to follow along, we're in Mark 12 and I'll be reading verses 18 through 27. Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began to question him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second married her and died, leaving behind no children, and the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman dies also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven married her. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you're mistaken? that you do not understand the Scripture and the power of God. For when they uh, rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but will be like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Illuminate our hearts and minds today, Lord, for what you would hold for us through this passage of Scripture. We pray it in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, as I said, is ministering in the temple, and he has the group come to him. 
Uh, Matthew says it's the same day that the Pharisees and Herodians came. And they came for the same purpose. The Sadducees came for the same reason. And that is to discredit Jesus. Before Jesus and before the people that had gathered in the temple courts. The Sadducees, they're a minority sect of, of Jews. But though they were few, they were powerful and they were influential. The Sadducees controlled all the buying, all the selling that went on in the temple. And so they were likely uh, angry with Jesus that had cleared the temple, had turned over their enterprises of, of selling and buying that were taking place in the temple courts as recorded in Mark 11. The Sadducees also not only controlled the buying and selling in the temple, the Sadducees controlled all the priesthood. All the chief priests, all the high priests were Sadducees. The Sadducees formed the majority of the Sanhedrin, which is like the Jewish Supreme Court. They were aristocratic. They were wealthy. They were friendly to Rome. But most of all, they were like the Herodians and the Pharisees. They hated Jesus. The Sadducees were uh, disliked by the common Jewish man. They were aloof. They were uh, thought, uh, or they thought themselves as better than anyone else. And so, uh, because of their rudeness, because of their insensitivity to other Jewish people, their judgments that were handed down were harsh. The common man disliked the Sadducees. But even more, they were disliked because of their theology. They accepted only the authority of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And what they believed was that this held the authority of all Old Testament Scripture. And the prophets and any other writings in the, the Old Testament were just supportive, but had no authority for doctrine. And so they took all of their doctrine from the first five books, the book of the laws, the book of Moses. And this doctrine was troublesome for the rest of the Jews. Because what they did was they just... They denied any supernatural events. They believed in the existence of God, but they rejected everything else supernatural. They did not believe in demons. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in heaven or hell. They did not believe in a final judgment. They did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They could not see any of these doctrines in the Pentateuch. Now, hear me when I say they could not see. They did not see any of these doctrines in the Pentateuch. So they just rejected it all out of hand. So... Because they did not believe in life after death, they did not believe in the resurrection, they lived their life for authority and power. It was said of the Sadducees that their philosophy was, eat, drink, and be merry, for I die tomorrow. They didn't care because they didn't believe there was anything after death. So why not live for today? Why not gain as much as I can today? And by the way, that mentality grips our world today. Many people that do not have hope or faith in the afterlife, the, the life to come with Jesus, they have this mindset that it's all about me. What can I gain? How can I prosper? What can I do today to make myself happy? I'm not worried about tomorrow or what tomorrow brings. And so many live within this same mindset today. No future judgment. No existence of heaven or hell. They believe there's nothing after death. They will not face God. I certainly hope there's no one with that mindset here this morning. Because I can tell you that there is a God and He has the final 
say. Amen. He has the final victory. He has the final authority over all things. And there is resurrection. And there is judgment. And He is the only hope of salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And those who come to faith in Him have the certainty of heaven before them. This is an interesting story that Mark gives us as this encounter takes place between Jesus and the Sadducees in the temple court because they come to Him much like the Herodians. You remember last week I mentioned that the Herodians came and they uh, flattered Jesus uh, teacher, you are truthful. You defer to no one. You show no partiality. You teach. You preach the truth of God. They were flattering Him before they tried to discredit Him. Here, the Sadducees come to Jesus and they call Him Master. To call Him Master is to call Him Teacher. And so, they are trying to get Jesus to bring His guard down, but it didn't work. And interestingly enough, they appeal to Moses, the lawgiver. Who else would the Sadducees appeal to? Because this is all that they held to doctrine were these first five books of the Bible. And so they knew that Jesus universally respected the Scriptures. They knew that He preached from the Scriptures. And so their approach to trying to discredit Him was to take Old Testament Scripture and trap him. Construct a puzzle for him where he could not answer. Thus, they would discredit him before the people that had gathered in the temple during this holy week, during this Passover week, trying to embarrass him before the people. So it didn't work, as we will see. They began to tell Jesus a story from the Old Testament. And it's the, the law of the Levite or Levirate marriage. And it comes from Deuter Deuteronomy 25, it's verses 5 through 10. And, and this law made provision for the Jewish families, the families of the Israelites, to continue their tribal name, to con uh, continue the inheritance, to keep it intact if a man died without having an heir. If a man died without having an heir, then the next of kin, if you read Deuteronomy 25, the next of kin is to marry that widow so that they can consum consummate the marriage, <coughs> hopefully have children, and that child would be raised as an heir of the dead man that died, the first husband. So that the inheritance, the line, would remain intact. The law was brought about uh, for the union of Judah and Tamar in Genesis 38. And this was to ensure that the line of Judah, Jesus, would come from the line of Judah. It also made possible the marriage of Ruth and Boaz in Ruth 4, which further ensured that Jesus would be born of the tribe of Judah. This was a very important law to those that were a part, those Israelites um, of the community because it guaranteed family inheritance. It guaranteed that there would be a further uh, extension of the family, that it would stay intact even if a man died having no children, no heir to carry on the family name. And so based on this law that came from Deuteronomy 25, the Sadducees come to Jesus and they pose this tale. And it's so interesting because they're the very ones that don't believe in the resurrection. But yet they come up with this tale about the resurrection to try to trap him. And so they come and they say, there's a man who dies without having an heir. And there's seven brothers. And so when this man dies, his brother marries his wife. And they have no heirs. And he dies, and the third one marries the wife. And they have no children, thus no heirs. And then they say, and it goes through all seven brothers. And then 
the poor woman does. I mean, the woman's married seven brothers, and they've had to try to have heirs, uh, no children born, and then she does. You've got to have some feeling the story in the story for this woman. Lord have mercy. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> My goodness. So, the woman does. So the question they now ask is, which husband, which one of the husbands, because they are very clear, she married all seven, which one of the husbands will she be married to in the resurrection? It's so interesting that they would pose that question because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Now, the Jews, well, except for the Sadducees, all the other Jewish sects that did believe in the resurrection, they actually believed that the family remained intact in the afterlife, that families would look the same in this world, would look the same in heaven. And so they would have had that mindset but not the Sadducees. They were just trying to mock Jesus. Maybe that's why they chose the resurrection as a ploy to try to trap him with this absurdity in their question. And so Jesus answers their question. Jesus answers their question. And he's going to answer their question with two specific, in two specific areas. The first thing he does is he says they're in error. That they have erred. In other words, they have gone astray in their thinking. Uh, this, in the, in the Greek, this is often looked at as not only as a mistake, but living in a dream world. And so this could be kind of um, in, the way you would hear it, I would hear it in the modern language. You men have no idea what you're talking about. You're living in a dream world. You are dead wrong in what you are saying. And how does he answer that as far as their error? The first one, coming from verse 24, is he says they're ignorant of the Scriptures. He says you are ignorant of God's Word. In other words, they only held to the first five books of the Bible. But if they would have read the entire Word of God that was contained in the Old Testament, if they would have read Job 19, if they would have read Isaiah 26, if they would have read Daniel 12, they would have had an understanding that the resurrection actually is true. It's going to happen. But they discounted that. They didn't hold that that had any doctrine in place. And furthermore, they could not see, as I said, any doctrine of the resurrection in the Pentateuch. So Jesus says, first, you're ignorant of the Word. Secondly, He says, you're ignorant of God's power. Interestingly enough, the Sadducees believed, they believed in God, they believed that God created all, they believed that God created the heavens and the earth, that God created everything on earth, that God created man and woman, that God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils. They believed all of this. They believed that ten plagues happened in Egypt to free the Israelites. They believed that God parted the Red Sea. They believed it. They believed that manna came from God. From heaven. They believed all of this. But they didn't believe God had the power to raise the dead. It was over with when you die. And Jesus says, you're in error. You, you don't even believe that in, in the Word of God, the Scriptures, and you also don't even believe in the power of God. You're ignorant, Jesus says. Let me remind you, unless you forget, that we serve an all-powerful God. And He is able in all things, even in the resurrection. Hallelujah. I'm glad God is. He is beyond any impossibility because all things are possible with God. So Jesus addresses 
some things in this passage that becomes interesting to us. They're asking about relationships. Is that not true? Whose wife will this woman be in the resurrection? I don't believe that, but Jesus sets them straight on that also. And so we have to first look at relationships. Relationships were created by God. First off, we were created to be in relationship with Him. That's why we as humans were created. That's first and foremost. But in Genesis, God says, I see that it is not good for man to be alone, and I will create for him woman, and they will come together, and they will be one. So in marriage, it's designed for companionship. Genesis 2.18. Marriage is also uh, is, uh, is there for the continuation, um, the uh, be fruitful and multiply, so that in marriage between a man and a woman cannot happen between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. It happens between a man and a woman that you are fruitful and can multiply and fill the earth. God's command. And then, second, and then thirdly, the purpose of marriage is to fulfill the legitimate sexual needs of man. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, 7, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5 lists for us how this relationship is to take place between a man and a woman when it comes to sexuality. And so we have to have that understanding of what Scripture tells us. And so when it comes to relationships, Jesus says there will be no marriage in heaven, no giving or exchanging of marriage in heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. But then we need to understand that he says when we go to heaven, we're going to be like the angels. And what he means by that is that we will have a be a spiritual being. We have a, a spiritual body, no physical necessities like we have on earth where, um, like the angels, there's no death, there's no sin. Um, we will have glorified, eternal bodies like the angels. But we will be something different than the angels also because John tells us that we'll look like Jesus, that we will be like Jesus. We will see Him just as He is. 1 John 3, 2. <clears throat> Can go and read that too. So we will be like Jesus, not just like the angels. And so there will be no childbirth in heaven because there will be no death. There will be no physical relationships in heaven, as I said, no marriage, uh, because there will not be any need for that. But there will be relationship. We will be in relationship with one another. And we will be in relationship with God in heaven. And the great thing about this is it's a perfect relationship. In other words, there is no jealousy in heaven. In our world today, we have jealousy. We have jealousy in our relationships. We see as boyfriend or girlfriend, you girlfriend or boyfriend looking at someone else and you become jealous. Are they interested in that one instead of me? And so love begins to wean. In heaven, there is no jealousy. There is no sin. In fact, the relationship is so perfect that we will love one another and love God. Now, I've had people say, well, heaven sounds boring. Heaven will not be boring. I can guarantee you that. It will not be boring. Jesus refers to the resurrection in this passage, and, and he nails that also. So they ask the question about marriage, and they're trying to catch him in this understanding of the resurrection. And Jesus goes straight to the point. He goes straight to the point. In verse 25, he says, For when they rise, for when they, not if they rise, he doesn't say if there is a resurrection. He says when they rise. And then, further along, he says, regarding the fact that the dead rise again, 
So twice in these verses, he says that there will be resurrection. And so we will rise again. Jesus points to back to Exodus in this passage to help them understand that they have erred both in the resurrection, there will be, and their understanding of relationships. And so what he does is he uses their own tactic of Scripture where they use Deuteronomy 25, the Leverite marriage. Jesus goes to the authority, Moses, as they see the lawgiver, and he uses Exodus 3 and 4 to make his counter-argument. Jesus talks about Moses' encounter at the burning bush with God. Four times in these two chapters, Jesus uses this statement, or God uses this statement with Moses. I am the God, the father of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Four times. Exodus 3, 6, verses 14 and 15, verse 16, and then in chapter 4, verse 5, God uses I am. He didn't say I was. If you look at the Hebrew text, it's in the present tense. I am the God. In other words, he didn't say these men were dead. He said these men are living. I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. They are living. In fact, if you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, you see that the God of Moses and Elijah, Moses and Elijah appear. They're not dead. They've passed on to eternal life, receiving their glorified bodies. And so Jesus just destroys their argument of no resurrection. He destroys their argument of the dead by saying, using their own scripture that they're holding to, I am the God. And then he closes this out with saying, He, referring to God, is not the God of the dead, but the living. And then repeats one more time as he began, you are, have erred. He now says, you are greatly mistaken. You are greatly mistaken. The promise of the resurrection holds true. Jesus has promised, I will go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come for you, so that, you know the rest of it? That where I am, you may be also. Where I am, you may be also. Jesus has prepared the way. He is the living God. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And those who have received Jesus Christ as Savior have this eternal life. They have passed from death unto life, as John says in chapter 5. If you back up a few chapters in John's Gospel to chapter 3, John says that you have to actually have new birth, that you are born again in Christ. You are given new life in Christ. And the person that has new life in him receives abundant life, John 10.10. 10. This abundant life leads us, as Suku aptly said in the John study on Wednesday night, that we are living out this eternal life. We, we, we start at this conversion of our new birth in Christ. And yes, eternal life is to come, but we start living eternally now in our faith. We begin to claim who we are in Jesus Christ. We believe because Jesus is the dividing line between life and death, between heaven and hell. He is the dividing line. And so I go back to these 
kind of these questions. This passage gives us some understanding of relationships in heaven. It gives us some understanding of there is a resurrection. It gives us understanding that Jesus is the God of the living and not the dead. But the scriptures tell us a lot more. I started to put this in your bulletin, but I'm going to have these pass around, take one and pass it. Um, Jane, let me have one. Um, I started to put in your bulletin as a handout, and I figured that uh, if I did that, by the time I got to the sermon, many of you will have already um, spent much of your time trying to use these passages to see if I was actually correct. Um, but what I wanted to do is just, as we look at this sermon, as we look at this text about heaven, this question about what heaven will be, as that's the, really the question, is there going to be relationships in heaven? What will it be like? What will heaven be like? The scriptures give us a wonderful view of what heaven looks like. You can take this and stick it in your Bible and you can look up these verses. Uh, hopefully there's enough to go around. But heaven is prepared by God. It's prepared by Christ. And there's not going to be any night. There's not going to, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, glorious and heaven will shine with God's glory. The gates will never be shut. The gates will never be shut. The river of the water of life will run through heaven. Abundant life will be there. The tree of life. The throne will be in its center. It's a place of holiness, of beauty, of unity, of perfection, of joy. Eternity. It is filled with singing. Ted, you will have a place there to play your guitar and uh, lead the singing. It is a place of service. And if, if that doesn't get you excited about what heaven looks like, and you can read some of these passages that will give you an understanding of the gold and, and all of the precious stones and, and how heaven looks, if that doesn't get you going, maybe what you will be will. And that is, you will be recognizable. You will be known, just as Moses and Elijah were known in heaven and on earth as they came at the Mount of Transfiguration. You will be recognizable. You will have a glorified body. And you will have unlimited, you will be unlimited by space. Eternal, glorious, no pain, no dying, no hunger, no thirst, and no sin. Thus, you will live perfectly in the relationship that God has put in place. As you have been faithful, God is faithful in all things. With that in mind, When we have loved ones that are in Christ, when we have loved ones that are dying and they're in Christ, it hurts because we know that we're going to miss them. And we ought to be excited because they get to go. They get to be in heaven. They get to be painless and sinless. And they get to be glorified. And they get to worship. And they get to sing. And they get to be of service of God. What a glorious place. Jesus is coming again. And whether I get to meet Him in my death, or I get to meet Him and rise when He comes again, I'm looking forward to the day. We were talking at practice this morning, and I said, yeah, I'm ready to go. Um, so, bring it on, Lord. Um, I'm looking forward to heaven. In this declarative statement that Jesus makes, this declarative statement that He gives the Sadducees, as the people are gathered in the temple court, as He makes this declarative statement, 
as recorded by Mark in this 12th chapter and this 27th verse. Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. You are mistaken. For me, I picture that kind of like a mic drop. Jesus is looking at them. He says, God's the God of the living, not the dead. You're mistaken. Boom. And he just turns around and walks off. Because he's just answered every one of their questions with the truth about what's to come. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all get to heaven, we'll get to sing and shout the victory. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm looking forward to it. Until then, let's serve God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage that lifts us up and gives us some, some great joy of, of what's to come. Yes, we want to live our life fully. Uh, we look forward to our family time and even today with our families and mothers and, and our friends. And yes, I want all of that. But Father, just the fact that we know where we're going to spend eternity, we know what life after death is from this place. What a joyous, wonderful excitement that we can have knowing what you have prepared for us, knowing you giving us that glimpse. Yes, there's some mysteries that we won't know until we get there, but until then, you have given us this glimpse, and it's exciting to know that we spend eternity with you. Thank you, Father, for your Son, his wonderful gift of salvation, his wonderful gift of eternal life, and we pray, Father, that not only we would live into that eternal life as we walk this journey, but, Father, we will have that passion and that glory anticipating that time with you. And, Father, we look forward to it. And it's in your Son's name that we pray.